Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the May Lee Show. This is actually our 33rd episode. Uh, and um, yeah, 33 episodes since the beginning of February, which is when we first launched the show. So not too shabby, right? 33 episodes so far uh, and been loving every minute of it. And then we also hit another milestone over the weekend. I was very happy about it. I posted it on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. We hit a thousand subscribers on YouTube. Now I know that's not a huge number compared to a lot of huge influencers and other celebs and other well-known people on uh, YouTube. But for me, for us at the Mainly Show, I mean, it was, it was definitely a milestone, you know, a thousand subs, believe it or not, it's not easy to reach that kind of number, especially in this day and age of so many people on YouTube, you know, kind of creating so much content. So, and it's all thanks to you guys, it, you know, your support and the fact that you've been with me all along the way and others joining just recently. And I love that people are discovering the show. So thank you so much. It really means a lot to me. And it you know, it, it means that it, it, this show is resonating. It's it's working. It's it's um, speaking to you in some way. And so, please, I know I sound like a broken record, but just keep spreading the word. Uh, tell people to subscribe. Tell people to check out the show either on YouTube or on any podcast platform, and uh, take a listen or take a look. Okay. So, but thank you. Um, you know one step at a time, as long as we're moving forward, that's, that's all that counts. Um, okay. So today's episode, I'm really excited about because I got to interview somebody who I love, uh, who is super talented and you're all going to know who he is. And that is Singaporean, Singaporean American writer, Kevin Kwan. He is, of course, the author of Crazy Rich Asians, the hugely successful book that was turned into a movie. Um, and I'm sure you've all seen it. I saw it multiple times, actually. I loved it. And, uh, and I had re read the book years before the movie came out, but of course the book crazy rich Asians is part of a trilogy. Uh, the other book being China, rich girlfriend and rich people problems. And so Kevin has now come out with a new book and it's called sex and vanity. It just came out at the end of last month, June. And of course, it's already a New York Times bestseller, doing phenomenally well. Um, and it is a story that really captivated me. I read it. Uh, well, actually, I listened to the aud Audible book because I love um, listening to the narration. And, you know, when you get to listen to a book, you get to do like stuff like I go hiking or I'll go paddle boarding, I'll go running and I'll be listening to the book. So this is a story uh, of a young woman who's Hapa. She's half- Chinese and half Caucasian. And it's a love story. She's torn between sort of like her Western side, her Chinese side, and she is engaged to a very waspy guy, very wealthy, um, who lives in Manhattan. Um, but then she struggles with kind of falling in love with a Chinese guy who is mysterious, interesting, and who she meets at a friend's wedding. So it takes place in both Capri, Italy, and then Manhattan. It's, it's, it's a great story. And in, in typical Kevin Kwan style, it is opulent. It's descriptive. It's just the, you know, illustrations that he writes out in his words. You are absolutely feel like you're there. So it's a great read, but it has a much deeper theme as well. Um, just like all of his other books, there's some deeper themes, um, some more substance uh, when you start reading the book, which is what I love about Kevin's Kevin's stories. So, uh, like I said, I got to talk to him just recently. He's on a virtual book tour right now. Obviously, because of COVID, he can't really go out on a real book tour, but he's been doing these virtual interviews and book tours uh, with people. He graciously gave me a ton of time the other day, and we had such a great conversation. And I learned so much more about him um, and his background. And he also gave me a really nice 
uh, comment about uh, being interviewed by me and the way in which I was interviewing him and the questions I was asking him. So that was a, we had like a love fest. <laughs> okay. So I hope you guys enjoy the interview. So here it is with Kevin Kwan. Kevin, welcome to the show. It's so good to meet you this way. It's, it's, <laughs> is it though? Really? Yeah, well, I, mean, I know I'm lying. I'm totally lying. I'd, I'd much rather to be having person. coffee with you right now, you know, somewhere <laughs> in <laughs> I know. the OC, Newport beach. It's so true. And I, <laughs> uh, until recently, I had no idea you lived in LA. I didn't know that. Yeah. I actually keep it kind of on the down low. Yeah. Well, I did figure that out I'm after still, doing some research. I'm still a New Yorker in denial. You know what I mean? So I, like. <laughs> I figured that because, you know, I used to live in New York as well. And I don't yeah. know if you know, I, I lived in Tokyo, Hong Kong and Singapore for many years too. Mm -hmm. And then New York. And then when I moved to LA, it was definitely a culture shock for sure. I'm loving it. Yeah. I have to say it's, it, I think I was ready for a change after 22 years in, in Manhattan. Yeah. It's, it's nice to be living in shorts and sandals like I did <laughs> back in true. Singapore. It's, it's nice to like not think about the weather and With, not think about rain. And yeah. Like, but without the humidity of Singapore, that's the one thing I oh, could yeah. not, I could never get used to that in Singapore. It's, it's unlike any other place in the world. I yeah. think when you're on the equator, the level of humidity and just, how heat affects your body yeah. there is like nothing else. Yeah, I'd no. rather be in the Sahara. You know, I'd rather be in dry heat. Oh, for a hundred times yeah. uh, for me, yeah. for sure. So, but we'll get to Singapore stories for sure. But um, first of all, congratulations on the new, new book, Sex and Vanity. Thank you. Um, I just finished it and I did the audible version of it. Uh, Lydia Read Look. Read by Lydia Look. She's really yeah. good because I did the auto, audible uh, versions of your two other books. I read Crazy Rich Asians many years ago. Mm -hmm. And then the yeah. following two, I did the audible. She's really good. I like how she's, she narrates. She's amazing. Yeah. She's, it's, it's her, she has a genius with accents. She does. And not just even with accents, with, with the cultural and the class level yes. of the accents. So she does Hong Kong Tai Tai like no so one else. So well. <laughs> she you does. know what I mean? Yes. Like, <laughs> so like Rosemary <laughs> Zhao, the character, is yeah. spot on. For sure. And then, of course, when she, when she did some of my other books, Rich People Problems, yep. the nuances that she put into each character. And you could even, you could really hear the class differences between yes. Astrid and, and, you know, Kitty Pong and the things education like that. It was, it was level. So like, cool. yeah, yeah. Were they educated in the UK? Were they local? Yeah. All of that. So yeah. Um, yeah. Because audible books, I've listened to many. And if you don't have the right person doing the reading, it yeah. can ruin the book. So uh, she's a keeper. For sure. She's, she's a prize, she's a precious <laughs> prize. <laughs> um, so I know that I've been doing some research on, on uh, the book and, and what inspired you. What I found fascinating that is that you said this is a book that was um, inspired. It was an homage to E.M. Forrester's A Room with a View, which was a book written in 1908. Um, and you read this as a, as a kid? I did. I was probably 15 when I, when I read the book okay, and, and absolutely loved it. Um, I began reading serious fiction at a really, per, really young age. Yeah. Like at 10, I was reading Danielle Steele and Sidney Sheldon. Wait a so minute. I got through my <laughs> trash fiction phase by the time yeah. I was like 12. And then okay. because this is, you know, serious British literature, you yeah. know, um, have you read the book? Which one? A room with the you? The Yeah. I have not. I, ha okay. I hate yeah. to say, yeah. I mean, it's especially after you've read my book now, yeah. go and read his okay. and watch the movie because I really feel like it's they are companion pieces. Oh. Because, in a way, that I use his book as a departure point, I play a lot of games and tricks, you know. Oh, interesting. With his book. And so, like, people who, who read the book and know the book, and there's a huge cult following for it, of course, yeah. you know. Yeah. I, I think they will appreciate my book on a whole other level oh. because they can see what I did to the characters, how I changed them, how I modernized them, and oh. how I totally also changed the storylines and stuff like that. Well, um, let's, so, we should mention know. that the storyline of Sex and Vanity is about a young woman who is half Chinese, half Caucasian, but American, right? And mm -hmm. uh, she goes to Capri for a wedding and she falls in love and then, you know, the story goes on from there. Uh, so, but, you know, from the, here's the thing, Kevin, what I love about your books is that at 
face value, if you just look at the title of the book, Sex and Vanity, you know, people would assume, oh, it's just some love story, some summer, mm -hmm. summer read. But when you start reading it, you start digging deeper into some more serious themes. Um, it's not just frivolity. It's, it's about family. It's always about family. It's about the Thank complicated you. nature of family. And this book I especially love because it was talking about identity. And especially within some of these characters like Lucy, who is half Chinese and half white, mm -hmm. and the struggle of that dual identity. Um, I know that that must have been very intentional on, on your part. It really was. I, you know, I personally had never read a book that had a Hapa protagonist before. Yeah. And I have so many close friends and family members who, who are Hapa. You know, right. so many of my cousins are Hapa. And it's been interesting to observe them and to observe the different journey everyone has. Because it's it really is an interesting situation to find yourself being born into. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm trying to say this in as you know, delicate way as possible. Um and it's it's so dependent. Everyone has a different experience. Yeah. Yeah. I find it's there is no universal Hapa experience. Yep. Except for maybe if, you know, it's interesting. I have a very good friend who's Hapa and he called me when he read a very pivotal line in the book. Mm. You know, where someone asks him, like, do you feel more Asian or do you feel more Caucasian? Like, what are you? You know, right. and he's like, Kevin, I screenshotted that page and I sent it to everyone I know because this is the story of my life. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. I've been asked that question a million times. And to me, it's just the most idiotic question <laughs> in the world to ask someone. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, so I felt like, you know, I was really intentional and I really wanted to... In, as authentic and as heartfelt a way represent, you know, yeah. um, that, that community, um, authentically. Right. Right. But you know, and so far the responses from Hapa people have been pretty unanimously amazing. So oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. Yeah. You know? I'm not surprised at all. Cause because I think you really hit yeah. it on the head, um, pretty accurately, but also Kevin, I think what's interesting is even for those of us who are, I'm fully Korean, my parents immigrated yeah. from Korea. Um, but I also grew up with I, that identity crisis of mm -hmm. what am I, who am I, which group do I want to belong in? And it's just that same feeling of, am I American, which that back then in my time would defined as white or yeah. am I Korean, which meant I was an outsider. And so I think those are the dynamics that we all can relate to, whether we're half or whole or whatever. I mean, we, we do Absolutely. feel that way. Or if you're FOB like me, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's, it's interesting, right? Yeah. Just being Asian in America, whether you're half Asian or Asian born in America or right. Asian immigrant like me, yep. there's a commonality and experience because when we collide with the West, yep. when we collide with this culture, something happens <laughs> or should I say shit happens? Shit happens right? for sure. <laughs> and so, yeah. I wanted, like, how could I really portray that? I've already done my Rachel Chu. Yeah. I've already shown an Asian American colliding with the East. Right. Now I wanted to show an Asian colliding with the West. And what better way to do that than to have someone that's literally, her DNA is half Asian, half Caucasian. Right. And what kind of struggles would she have being in that interesting body? Yeah. And how does that affect her identity and her, her, her need for acceptance? How does it affect her ability to have romance and who she's attracted to and right. who she feels like she belongs to? Exactly. Um, all these issues I felt were, 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 I was able to meaningfully explore them with a character like Lucy Tang Churchill. Which again, you did so beautifully because you do explore that psychology of someone like Lucy who tries to say, what should I be doing versus what do I want to do, right? Do I, Thank do you I, for saying that. Yeah, who Thank do I you. really you, want to be, right? Yeah, and it's interesting because I'm realizing now, so I've been on a virtual media tour for the last four weeks. Okay. And it's been intense. You know, I've done like five to 10 interviews a day. Oh my God. And you are one of the only... Asian people that's actually interviewed me. I'm not surprised. It's it's interesting. And the Asians in Asia who have talked to me about the book or who have reviewed the book, they don't get it at all. 
Oh, really? Okay. They don't get it at all. I, I can see that. I can totally you know, see there that. Was a, there was a critic, you know, in a certain Asian country that was like, this book is meaningless trash or whatever. You know, I'm paraphrasing. But, like, they were not impressed. And it's like, oh, wow. well, you really didn't see anything. Like, you didn't, you lost. Nope. You didn't get the point. But exactly. it's interesting. And I'm not critical of that. It's because they have no basis of it, the experience. Right. Exactly. When you are privileged in Asia, how would you know what it feels like to be an other? Exactly. You know what exactly. I mean? How and would you see Lucy and, and how would you experience her issues? You wouldn't. Right. Just like white reviewers. Yeah. You know, there have been a couple of white reviewers who have reviewed my book. And one actually said that having a biracial character in my book was meaningless. <gasps> She said it added up to nothing. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, uh, what book were you reading? She said that to you? Uh, well, I mean, she said in her review. Oh, my God. She wrote that in her review. You know, that it was actually, I have the quote here because I was in such <laughs> Oh, my. Okay, okay that's just, that's offensive on so many different levels and so yeah. off the mark that it's, it's laughable, actually. But please it's, read it. It's laughable. Read the quote if you can find it because and, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's laughable and it's sort of, sorry, I have to take my glasses off when I do this. That's um, okay. Um, I, because I identified and I was, seriously, when I was listening to this book, I'm like, oh my God, Kevin got this so right on so many different levels. And I thought back on my yeah. childhood and my, yep, hey, Thank you. Thing. So to quote this yeah. review, yeah. you know, though Quan hints at the complexities of being mixed race, there's no deep, meaningful takeaway buried in the story. Oh my God. And oh I was like- God. What have you been reading? And then I, I, I actually looked at a picture of her, you know, and she is a very blonde, blue-eyed woman. And it's like, well, there you have it. Of course, you know, you're critiquing this book with zero frame of reference. Yeah. No, no understanding and whatsoever. that's your limitation. And yeah. so I have to appreciate your limitation because I'm not even offended. It's just like. Well, I'm offended for you then, Kevin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, he, you so know, it's so nice to be in dialogue with I'm you so glad and someone who is actually Asian. And I actually wish saying that. there were more Asian writers, Asian American writers yeah. who, you know, would review the book. No, or I mean, who I, would interview me. Look, you know, here's the thing, Kevin, you're proving the point of why yeah. representation matters in all yeah. fields, because if you don't have that firsthand perspective, that firsthand experience to be able to connect with a story like yours, then how mm -hmm. the hell are you going to process that and then convey that to the general public who's going to go exactly. on your review, right? And and just yeah. think that this is, oh, okay, this is accurate, right? So representation exactly. matters. I can't believe I'm still saying that, but okay. But thank you for saying I that mean, about yeah. I you mean, know, it's my just, understanding. It's <laughs> Yeah. It's almost silly that we're still having this conversation. Uh, and we will, we it's, will it's, continue to. It's just, it's just proving to me how salient a point it is in this day and age. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Well, I um, will say yeah. that I told you that I, I connected with this book and the themes of it on very, a, a lot of levels in, in, in particular, um, you know, you talk about each character, you introduce each character and you start. Uh, you start l listing their educational <laughs> background, right? We all yeah. know it's because a lot of Asians, most Asians care so deeply about, you know, schooling and all of that, but also um, the highbrow, you know, class of the UK and even in the US, right? They yeah, care the, about which I schools. really was satirizing. It was really meant to be a satirization of the WASP society that yeah. I found myself encountering when I moved to New York. Because, you know, I grew up in Texas, right? I grew I up in know. suburban Texas. I, I grew up in Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's like everyone's dream. I, you know, I had a very <laughs> low achieving high school years. But like <laughs> everyone's dream was to get into UT, you know. Ah. Which at that time, I mean, UT now is extremely hard to get into, you know. Okay. It's like one of the f top state schools. It's like, you know. Um, but back then it was like. Not that hard. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Put it this way. And I couldn't even get into UT. Like, I was like one of the idiots that okay. was like, <laughs> I went to junior college, right? <laughs> so to come from that, and then I had a great public education. I went to University of Houston, where okay. I feel like I had an amazing education, right? I moved to New York. And it's interesting, being in New York in your early 20s, and you're meeting other young post-college grads, Yeah. within three minutes of meeting them, it's like they have to like tell you their entire educational resume. 
they have to shut off. You know what I right, mean? Right, right. And maybe it was the circles I was in, but it was always like Harvard, 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 Princeton, Princeton, Princeton. Right. You right. know, or all these elite Ivy League esque schools. Yep. You know, Colgate, Amherst. Cornell, you know, everyone's bragging about their schools and not even just their schools, their prep schools, yes. Andover, Groton, Correct. you know, St. Paul's, yeah, whatever Exeter, it is. Yep. It's mm -hmm. the calling card. It's the way to also connect and find out where you are and to stratify you in their world. Yes. You know, so I just had really had fun, you know, sort of satirizing what I experienced, you no, know, and I in had, this world of WASP because that's all they do. Chuckle. They talk about their schools. Yeah, I had a good chuckle because, uh, because I knew exactly what you were doing. Yeah. But also I chuckled extra hard because one of my schools was mentioned several times. Oh, really? <laughs> Don't roll your eyes, Kevin. Do not roll your eyes. And I'll tell you why. You went to Smith. Nope. I will tell you why I'm bringing it up. There's a very valid reason why I'm bringing this up, not to okay. show off or anything. Yeah. No, I went to Miss Porter school. I did. Now. Well, I, I, I can't even believe I got to talk to you. <laughs> I'm bringing this up because I am not, obviously I'm not yeah. a waspy girl, you yeah. know, going to this school. It, it, I did get a great education, I have to say. And that's but the you, reason I went. you had such an amazing entry point into that world. I did. And I had course, a very yeah. interesting, so I got a firsthand perspective into this yeah. world, right? And what I, you know, learned from that experience is that, yeah, there is this world that exists of wasps who are on the outside, very kind, you know, mm -hmm. they're never rude because that's the way they're taught, right? But internally, yeah. I know that they looked at me as an outsider and that I was never going to fully be accepted into their world. Mm -hmm. And again, in this book, when you were talking about how Lucy was treated and others and, you know, the mothers of uh, like George's mother and all of that, you, I got that feeling of like, yeah, that's exactly how it is. They may be on mm -hmm. the outside, you know, very posh and polite, right? Mm -hmm. But inside well, they assassinate you of the politeness. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's a good way you to know, put it. Like <laughs> the insults, you don't even know they're insulting you. Yeah. Um, that's true. It was interesting. I, you know, I, I sort of got an intimate look into this world and, you know, sort of have became very good friends with people in this world and the subtleties of how they behaved reminded me so much of old guard Singapore. Mm. which is why I think I got along so well. Like, the, you know, these moms adored me. I was sort of brought into the family because they realized that I got it. Yeah. They oh. didn't have to explain to me the rules. Okay. They knew they could count on me to like not be a disgrace. <laughs> and I would be like, you know, like the very appropriate token Asian. Right. That showcased their worldliness, you know. I mean, I'm being, that's a very cynical point of view. Actually, th these were lovely people that just took me in. Same, you know? so, no, 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 same but, with me. Yep. Yeah. But but you, I, I don't know about you, Kevin, but yeah. I definitely still felt a little unease when I was mm -hmm. invited to the Upper East Side to stay with somebody's, yeah. you know, very posh, you know, blue blood grandmother or mm -hmm. going to the Yale club, you know, with my friend and you know, her parents. And I just never, yeah. I still felt uneasy. Right. Yeah. I never felt completely I can, comfortable. I can completely under see that. I can completely understand. I think I felt much more at ease in that world because it's the world I, I sort of grew up in. In Singapore. In Singapore, right. going to private clubs right. and, and going to dinners and there would be a, a Thai princess at lunch, yeah. you know, and a minister of finance. And so like I was raised to know how to behave in that world. Right, right. And when you grow up in that world, it's like it's really not that special. You right. Know? And so you like, came you from just, a different place in terms yeah, of your so I had a different entry mind. point into it. And so right. I think I was able to just appreciate it for what it was. Right. And see the actually see the commonalities. Because where I did stick out was suburban Texas. Let me oh, God. It. <laughs> I, I'm you sure. You know what I mean? Oh, like, God, I was, yeah. I was much happier going, you know, to the university club and having, you know, dinner there with a, with a family than going to a football game. Right. You know. Right. In, in Texas or, you know, a barbecue cookout, um, you know. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about a culture shock going to Texas. Yeah. Um, so, Kevin, obviously, because of your upbringing in Singapore, um, and again, I didn't know this before I started doing some research on you, mm -hmm. that your great-grandfather was the founding director of Singapore's oldest bank, right? 
Overseas Chinese yeah. Banking Corporation. Um, I mean, you come from a you come from a very posh background in Singapore, where it was just sort of that was your life, and so therefore your, uh, you know, your your knowledge of that mm -hmm. upper class was yeah. always there. But then your interest in digging deeper into that world of wealth, snobbery, but then digging even deeper. Mm -hmm. um, came later, right? When you went and spent time with your father who was uh, very ill with cancer. Right? It was actually more that, you know, when you're a kid, yeah. you don't really realize where you come from, True. right? Yeah, oh, yeah, for, you, for sure. you grew up in a house. This yeah. is your family. These are your extended family. You don't realize if this person is important. You don't realize if they're a billionaire. It doesn't really matter when you're a kid. Yeah. They're just people, Yeah, you know? And it took my coming out of that and being transplanted to, you know, Texas mm. in the middle of nowhere and into a very middle class world to realize, oh, like here I am now and it's so vastly different from where I was. Why did your parents and, go to Texas? You know, it's a it's a long story, okay. but. I, ultimately, my dad really loved having an American lifestyle. Really? He wanted to be a normal American. Oh, wow. He had no interest in social Singapore. And he came from a very social huh. family, very political, very, you know, these were these were the power elite of Singapore. And right. he was singularly uninterested and unambitious, you know, and but he was privileged. You know, yeah. he came from extreme privilege. And his parents sent him away to boarding school when he was 13 years old. And he was in Australia for t more than 10 years. Wow. So he went to prep school there. He went to college there. Like his formative years were in Australia. In the summers, he would work on a ranch in the outback. Okay. So he really loved that world. I see. And then, you know, when he was in his mid-20s, his parents were like, okay, you're done playing around in Australia. It's <laughs> time to come back to Singapore and be the dutiful son. And marry an appropriate girl and give us grandchildren mm. and, you know, take your place in the family. Right. Um, and I think he did that very grudgingly and was basically plotting his, his escape for 25 years, really? quite frankly. Okay. Yeah. And so, and finally he was able to, and, I, and he really wanted to raise us in a more Western world. Hmm. Um, he just always felt like there were more, you know, he knew we, you know, we weren't smart kids, put it this way. We weren't thriving in that education system. Okay. And he's like, I want to get my kids out of that system. I have creative children. Huh. You know, I I want them to experience the West that I know. Right. And he, you know, there was an opportunity to move to Houston. So we did. Wow. And he was right because his kids who were not book smart really thrived in America. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you grateful. Know, in a way. You're yeah. grateful that they moved to the U.S. then. I am so grateful. Yeah. I'm so grateful. Um, and I'm really grateful that I had this upbringing in Singapore where I was old enough to be conscious of that world, yeah. but young enough to be taken out where I could really adapt to, right. to becoming American. Right. right. Um, but I think I was able to have a very different immigrant experience than most people because I, I grew up an embodied Asian kid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I, I, so I came to the U.S. not having an inferiority complex, inferiority complex. Like I think that a lot of Asian American kids do when they grew up in America. Yes, that is with, absolutely correct. With with being a minority in a in a majority culture, you yes. know. Um, I came from Chinese privilege. I didn't know any different. So it was interesting because I didn't even know the rules of engagement when I I was plopped down at age eleven into eighth grade. Hmm. USA. Yeah. In and Texas no of all places. Idea, you know, from yeah. Texas. And I was a kid that grew up going to school in a uniform every day. Yeah. You know, that's very equalizing. Yeah. In a way. You didn't know if the kid, I mean, you kind of knew, but like, you know, there was the kid of a billionaire next to you in class, but he was in the same uniform. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it's boy school, very equalizing. And then suddenly I'm in the mix of an all American high school and People are dating and, and like eighth graders are like necking each other in <laughs> the bathrooms. <laughs> but Kevin, <laughs> and even, there are all these rules. Honest, and I was just like, this is fascinating. I know, but even honestly, yeah. even at 11, though, even though you're saying that you yeah. are already sort of at this level of, ident you know, self-awareness yeah. and all of that. Still, that's a stark change to go from that in Singapore to in the middle of Texas 
as an Asian kid, as an immigrant. Mm -hmm. And so that's got to come from somewhere in terms of that level of confidence. I mean, were you always yeah. a confident kid and just so self-aware or was it just, you know, you just wanted to absorb the environment and you were like, I don't care what yeah. people think. Cause that's pretty maybe, cool. You know, maybe I was, I, I, yeah. I, I think I was just sort of, um, by totally by accident, you know, just sort of, I always had a very, I was always very assured in who I was, mm. you know, okay. even as a, kid in Singapore and then here, you know, in this new environment. But I think what made it interesting was that I could, with the huge contrast, I could begin to see these patterns of like the class structure that existed even in my high school cafeteria. Yeah. And that yeah. began the fascination. Right. And to contrast that with what I knew back in Singapore, you know, that I think began my li lifelong interest in social structures. Yeah. You know, right. um, people always say, oh, he just writes about the rich, he just writes about rich. But really, I'm really writing about a wide spectrum of people. For sure. Uh, you know, in my books, I'm writing about the underclass, yep. the working class, the service class, and the upper class. Because you have to see that contrast yep. to appreciate how it works. And the you know? subtleties of it. And the way and the in which they interact with each other. Yeah. Uh, because it's it's not black and white, right? There are subtleties. And also, Kevin, you also explore... Um, racial differences, of course, at face value, but even mm -hmm. the subtlety of, um, I think at one point in the book, um, Asian to Asian, Asian to Asian, Asian to white, but <laughs> Racism, then also like what it is. being half or one eighth yeah. white and how one mother I think says he's has that one eighth Caucasian. That's why he's so good looking or something like that in the book. Yeah. And I was she like, actually does say that. Yes. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, that's so realistic because you do also find that of that still that idea that white is more beautiful, white is more handsome, right? And so you if you have that white blood, it makes you more superior somehow. And so I just found that yeah. fascinating as well. I, you know, on one of my trips back to 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 Asia, to I will say to an Asian country that shall remain unnamed okay. because I don't want to <laughs> implicate anyone. But, you know, um, and I was a teenager and there was a, a person that I met, an adult, who said to me, literally, she was like, you know, from here down, you look great. <laughs> you know, and you just need to get your eyes done. Uh, and so she was like, while you're here, Kevin, you know, like, let me take you to my doctor and well, let's just get your eyes done. Cause from here down, you look great. <laughs> but it's just your eyes that need some work. Yeah. Wow. You know, this is an Asian relative, mind you. Yeah. She came from a place of kindness, but you know how they criticize to be kind. Oh, no, right? no, no, of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I was just remembering even then, and I was probably 15 years old, but I was just, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> but did it, you know, did it impact you in any way? No, no I, it if didn't. anything, it galvanized me to oh, like, okay. no, I'm not going to, like, I like my Chinese eyes. I See, have no desire are, to, you know, I'm you not are, judging, I'm not judging people who, who want to get blepharoplasty. Right. But you, you are know. different than Kevin at 15, yeah. uh, you know, usually teenagers are so awkward at that age and we're so mm -hmm. insecure and we don't, you know, we don't like what we look like, you know? Yeah. And so for someone of that age to be like, no. I like what I look like and you're not going you, to, that's not going to impact me. So mm -hmm. there you were different then as a kid, if, if that yeah. was your reaction. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. 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 I guess. But I just had no interest. I was like, this is the face that God gave me. Yeah. And I'm not going to do anything to it because this is what makes me, me. Right. You know, and I don't think I'm as ugly as you think I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Good for you, Kevin. You know, yeah. Not that I'm vain or not that I'm thinking I'm God's <laughs> gift or anything like that. But you know what I mean? But I'm just like, I don't see the need to cut my face yeah. to fit into what I even knew back then is a Western ideal. Right, right. And that's so she's true. a product of a colonial system that's telling her that, you know, whites have better features. And it's interesting. And it's very perverse what's happened in Asia. Yeah, it is. You know, the skin whitening, the plastic surgery. So much plastic I mean, in, surgery. In, in Korea, you oh. know, I mean, have you read Francis Cha's book, 
if I had your face. No, and I, that's on my list of I mean, books that I need to be reading. Do. Is She's it amazing? Amazing. You need to have her on your show. Oh, it's I would such love an to. A stunning debut book. I'm telling yeah. everyone about it because I just, you know, I, I love to support other Asian writers. Yes, yes. But this is a stunning book, and it's such, it's so, rev- it's such a revealing portrait of modern Korean women today and what they have to go through. You know, the pain, it's the awful. physical pain of like, I didn't realize how prevalent and common plastic surgery was there. And oh my God, it, it's so you know. prevalent. Yeah. But the ideal they're achieving is this westernized ideal. Yeah, it's true. Kevin, you know? I, I don't know if you saw, I think it was a couple of years yeah. ago where someone had put together a graphic of all sort of the top, you know, uh, Korean models and actresses mm-hmm. and, you know, and influencers, whatever. And they put all the photos together and they literally all look the same because they had all gotten the same procedures. Yeah. Eye, nose, cheek, you know, the jaw narrowing everything. It just, yeah. it was, in, it's insane. So, and I think of yeah. those K pop boy band um, guys, yeah. you know, who have done so much surgery to themselves that, you know, and now they look like anime cartoon characters, right? Yeah. A lot and of them do. There, yeah. is a, there is, you can see there's a physical ideal they're searching for yes. and there is this compositional perfection right but i just think what are they going to look like in 10 years well i don't i think their faces they start fall to off. age <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, yeah but beyond falling off they're going to have odd faces it's they're not natural looking right right you know what i mean when half like of right it is now not, they yeah. look like a you know they look like a photoshopped ideal right but when you start to age and your skin starts to sag i guess they maybe they won't they'll just keep tightening and tightening and i know but what, this whole what's whole species left, of i know but what's left yeah, to tighten yeah. you know it's almost <laughs> like you just need a face like transplant yeah. or something you know um okay well let me ask you about this because i'm I, i've always been curious when i read your books you write with such unbelievable detail uh, from everything from the decor of a room that the character walks into to the history of a location to, you know, the artwork. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think to myself, man, is Kevin like that informed about so many different things or does he have this amazing research team or has he experienced this all <laughs> himself? I mean, I literally am like, wow, this is yeah. incredible. So well, I hired work? the entire Wikipedia team to help me write all my books, <laughs> and they do they do everything. Actually, I I do I just direct, and I'll like give a plot point. And okay. yeah, I don't um, think no. so. No, I mean I really I do zero research. Really, and I'm yeah I do zero research. I'm really cursed with a photographic memory. Oh my it's both God. a blessing and a curse because I remember everything I see. I don't wow. remember words, so I can't memorize a poem or a. Bible passage, right? Okay. <laughs> Anything to save my life. But visual scenes, what you're wearing, the necklace you have on, like I'll remember it for the rest of my life, the dinosaur behind you, you know what I mean? Wow. Like, and so I can re-describe them in books. But to, um, I mean, but to detail that, that it just is awe-inspiring. I'm like, now you know. that you're saying that it's just from memory, that's even more impressive. That's crazy. It's, it's all from memory. And it's both a blessing and a curse because there are things I wish I had never seen. <laughs> Seriously, you know. Oh, no. George I, Floyd, the video. Oh, like, no, 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 you're right. And you're these right. are things that I can't ever forget. Yeah. They're just sort of embedded in like virtual reality, high definition in my in my head. Wow. So it's both a blessing and a curse, I have to say. But how do you um, know all of this about so many different places? I mean, even, uh, okay, I'm assuming you've been to Capri because the, the descriptions of Capri are, are amazing. Never been to Capri. Wait. Ever. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> That oh, would be wild, wouldn't it? That but would be crazy. It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> there are many people that write about places or yeah. civilizations they've never been to. It's exactly. Fiction. But no, I have been to Capri. It's it's really kind of one of my favorite places, and I've been lucky enough to go many, many times. Ah, uh, okay. So, that explains yeah, it. It's, yeah, it's it's a it's a regular haunt. So okay. I'm able to write about restaurants I love and sandal makers and you know all the things I love about it. So it's I cheat. I write about but stuff I know. Yeah. You know, and yeah, it makes yeah. it easy. Well, you know a uh, lot. I set then. books in, in places where I been to. That's um, why I bring this up because I'm like, wow, yeah. Kevin has either been like to so many places and done so many yeah. amazing things, or else he's you know drawing upon other people's experience or something. Yeah. So that's I've also cool. had a very interesting, strange Frankenstein like career. You know, yeah. um, I the, 
the problem with me is that I'm really a dilettante. Like I've never been able to commit to one thing. Mm. And so my entire career in New York, well, first of all, even my schooling, you know, I, I yeah. got a creative writing media studies degree. Then I went to art school right, and studied right. photography and design. And then when I started working, I could never find a job that was perfect for me because I didn't want to just do one thing. Mm. You know, I didn't want to just be a graphic designer or just a music video editor or anything like that. I wanted to do a, a wide variety of things. And I was able to, you know, I was lucky enough where I found the right people to work for. You know, okay. um, I went to work for this amazing creative visual genius named Tibor Kalman. Mm. Um, he was on paper known to be, he was called the bad boy of graphic design. Mm. Um, so he designed all the album covers for the Talking Heads. Oh, wow. You know? Okay. Um, he designed Colors Magazine. Do you remember Colors Magazine? The Benetton? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes, yes. So he was this iconic designer back in the 80s and 90s. Okay. But he hated to label himself as a designer because he did a million things. Yeah. He directed Talking Heads music videos. You know, he was involved in high-level consulting. He rebranded Barnes & Noble. Oh, wow. Do you remember when Barnes Barn & Noble went from being a stuffy little mall bookstore yes, to these and beautiful exactly, huge places stores with Starbucks and You wanted to hang out in. And yes, yes. That was he all did his that. idea. Oh. He did that. He said, let's make it like a, like a private living room. That oh, people wow. want to hang out in. Okay. Um, okay. So I went to work for him um, in his creative studio, where I learned to do a million different things. Uh, you know, and it was kind of this perfect job for me. Yeah. Because I could do so many things. I could work on design. I could work on photography. I could help him curate books. And then he passed away uh, about a year and a half after I went to work for him. Oh, mm. okay. Okay. Um, he had been sick already. You know, I, I knew that, you know, he was going downhill. Yeah. But it was such a privilege to work for this genius. Yeah, right. What a great influence that, on yeah, you. After that, I knew I couldn't work for anyone else. Yeah. So I started my own business. I started my own consultancy. Okay. And from there, I was really able to work with a wide variety of clients um, on so many different projects. You know, I helped to design the TED.com website. Oh, Wow. I did a book for Elizabeth Taylor. I curated her entire jewelry collection and had it photographed and made into a book called My Love Affair of Jewelry. Oh, you my know. God. Um, I, you know, I would do set design um, for dance theater in downtown New York. Um, you know, so, like, I, I oh, kept on doing so many different diverse things. And I think okay. that really fed me. Oh, for sure. And gave me a basis of, you know, it's like, I'm yeah. kind of like Seinfeld. I know so much about... So many inconsequential <laughs> stuff, you know, which kind of is great for a book. But it is. Nothing it's else. Really. No, yeah, no, it's book, no. Good for a book or a sitcom. Or, you know or, I mean? or a cocktail party. I mean, you'll, yeah. you'll always have something to say and have a story to tell. So Yeah, um, except that I'm horrible on a social level. <laughs> like I you? have nothing to say socially whenever I'm around can, people. You know, you can know? I ask you a question about George, the character in Sex and, and Vanity? Because after mm -hmm. I finished it and then I started reading a little bit more about you, yeah, I was I asked myself, I wonder if Kevin is kind of like George, and I'll explain why I mm -hmm. wondered that. Because George, the character in your book, is quietly very educated, intelligent, worldly, sophisticated, but he never flaunts it. He never wants to show off, but he's not ostentatious whatsoever, mm -hmm. and he just sort of observes the world right? Um, quietly rather than getting too deeply involved. Um, and when I started reading about you and how you actually don't like to socialize too much and you don't like to go to all these lavish events and be the center of attention, you'd rather observe. I thought, oh, that's interesting. It's, it's kind of like his character, George. Any bit of well, George, George is, you is and George? much cooler than I will ever be, <laughs> first okay. of all. But yeah, I think there's a little of me in all the characters. But yeah, yeah there is a kinship between me and George because I am more introverted. I'm more the quiet guy that likes to just sit back and observe. Right, right. You know, and... Um, and that's why you yeah, write so well, I, th I think, because you observe everything so obviously with such incredible intention and can remember everything. That's, that's a pretty amazing yeah. gift. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. before I let you go, and I know you're on a very tight schedule, Kevin, um, COVID-19, uh, we all know that it's, you know, kind of never ending. And those of us who are here mm -hmm. in LA, we've been put back on kind of sort of mm -hmm. semi-lockdown again. But 
of course, the other re terrible result of COVID-19 has been the racism and the xenophobia against Asians, right? And that just seems to be getting worse, not better. Um, again, you know, as we talked earlier about being an outsider, is this, what is this telling you and what's this experience been like for you to observe as well? You know, it's been very, very troubling. Yeah. But at the same time, I feel like, I don't know. I, I tend to think that most people in this country have a goodness in them. You know, I, I, I see that. that all over. You know, yeah. I, I think there are far less racist people than there are racists. But this is the time for the racists to shine. <laughs> you know, no I mean... <laughs> I mean, they have a they have a they have a leader <laughs> that is championing their cause you I know? know so it's know. like it's, there's like free license and it's it's very very troubling and you know i'm hopeful and yet i just i'm also a realist of human behavior yeah and you know it wasn't too long ago that japanese americans were put in concentration camps exactly you know and it was my worry like okay what happens if we go to war with china god forbid like, will everyone that looks like me, yeah. you know, have to suffer the consequences? Um, so many of my friends, so many of my relatives actually have experienced racism during this time. Here in the States. Um, here okay. in the States. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and it's, it's really troubling. Yeah. But I think all you can do is draw awareness to it. Yes. Exactly. And all I can do is, this is why I think it's so important to keep trying to move the needle, to keep writing books, creating content that just really showcases a world of diversity. Exactly. And I see, you know, 90% 90, 90 of my readers are still white. Are they? Because that's, a, that's really? absolutely. Yeah. <gasps> because that's America. I mean, you know, Asians only account for, I think, what is it? 6% of the 6%, population. Yeah. So in order to be, not to toot my own horn or anything, like, in order to be a bestseller. Yeah. You have to have sold books to white people. That's like true. If I sold, true. <laughs> even if I sold all, if everyone in, in the Asian community in America bought my books, it wouldn't. I would still not be a bestseller. Yeah, you know? but oh I am my gosh. because yeah, it's I'm embraced by the population. You right. know, right. white people, black people, Hispanics, you know, people of all races read my books. Yeah, but I, you know, I'm doing two book events today, for example, and at all my book events it's usually a sea of white people huh. who are loving the books, loving the stories, loving the characters. You know, I was on Good Morning America the other morning. Um, they made me surprise this book club. Okay. And it was, you know, three white ladies, one Hapa, she's half Japanese, half white, and one Hispanic woman. And it's like, this is America. And wow. they're loving the books. That's awesome. I and love that. And it's showing that this is this is what people want. And yeah. so we just need more of that. We need more TV. We need more films. Yep. Yep. Because the more understanding there is, the less racism. Exactly. Basically. Exactly. And and being able to you tell know? those stories from different perspectives, but with a universal theme that everybody can connect yeah. to. And I think that's why initially Crazy Rich Asians did so well. Because it didn't matter it, that it was an all Asian cast. It no. was a story that everyone could connect to. Absolutely. But the beauty of how you write your books, Kevin, is that you do that universal theme that you know is going to captivate a broader audience, but then mm -hmm. you write to the Asians too. I mean, you do. You, you know yeah, that some things you. you're going to write yeah. about we're going to connect to. Like you said in the beginning, I connected to these things that mm -hmm. maybe some of these other people people who read your books wouldn't. So I appreciate the fact that you're balancing the idea that of course you have to write to a broader audience, but then you're mm -hmm. also respecting the culture and the tradition of the characters um, that are in your books. And I think that it makes for a much more sophisticated writer like you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, you're you welcome. Know. Well, just trying. Uh, no, and you you're know. you're trying and you're doing very well. Now, I know that the other two movies from the trilogy of Crazy Rich Asians, uh, China, uh, hang on, I can't get the- China Rich Girlfriend, China, Rich Girlfriend, and, Girlfriend and Rich People and, Problems. Yeah. And Rich People Problems. Those two are being worked on. I know some th delays because of COVID, but mm -hmm. they are expected to come out sometime soon-ish. Yeah, yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, hopefully, you know, every, everyone's hoping to go to production, you know, as okay. soon as we all can safely 
begin to film together, you know, Okay. okay. and um, it's going to be so fun. I mean, what, what, you know, I've been able to preview the script and then see what they're doing and it's going to be such a fun ride, yeah. you know, if we can pull it off and I'm sure John, John Chu will do an amazing job. No, he's masterful so, for sure. Very, very exciting. Yeah. You know. Um, is but it we a, have to be able to go to Asia to film it. And I right know. Now, I was just going to say. They're not letting us in. <laughs> you can't. I mean, we can't go anywhere. Americans are like, the, we're like the yeah. pariahs of the world right now. Our yeah. passport is completely useless, so we can't go yeah. anywhere. Um, Kevin, I, I don't know if I can bring the subject up and, and, and to tell me to shut up if you don't want to talk about it. But um, I interviewed Adele Lim not too long ago, a couple months ago on mm-hmm. the show. And, you know, we, of course, talked about um, her leaving the project. Uh, because of the pay mm-hmm. disparity um, with the other screenwriter. Was that upsetting for you when that happened? I mean, can I just get your reaction to that? Or, and again, if you don't want to talk about it, mm-hmm. you certainly don't have to. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was absolutely upsetting and perplexing. And, you know, it happened on a level that I was not even involved in. You know, mm-hmm. I'm just the writer. Yeah. And so, yeah. like, this is studio level agents doing stuff. So, like, I was as surprised when. Mm-hmm all this news hit as anyone else. And, you know, it's, 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 it's hard. I (laughs) am very, very glad she stood up for what she believed in. Yeah, exactly. Especially as an Asian woman. I think that was really important for her to make that statement. Yeah. Yeah. And I think writers in general, they always get short shrift in Hollywood, mm -hmm. even though you are so essential. Right. You know, it's right. it's interesting how Hollywood always places, you know, the director as God and the actors are all princes, princes and princesses. And as a writer, you know, you are ultimately very devalued, quite yeah. frankly. It doesn't make sense. It's very backwards, um, and, and even isn't I it? see it, you know. Um, mm. So it's it's fascinating to, to sort of – all this has to be part of a big change, Yeah, I think. Yeah. You know. Right, right. Um, there needs to be systemic change on so many levels yeah. in Hollywood. Absolutely. And there also need to be, you know, it goes both ways. There need to be more executives behind the scenes <sighs> sure. who are, you know, in positions of power, but who are also Asian, who can advocate for us. Right. Well, you know, again, number one. But then also within the culture, we have to encourage people to take the risks. Yeah. You know, and do this, you know, and not just go after the Ivy League degree right? and not just, you know, become a lawyer or an accountant or, or something yes. super safe just to make your parents happy. That's right. You know, that's right. Yeah. Um, or to, to live up to, you know, so our perceptions and how we contribute to the culture needs to change as well. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so whenever I find creative people who are trying to do things differently, who are Asian, I try to support them 100 percent. That's great. Be they writers or screenwriters or actors or musicians or, you know, I, I even know, you know, modern dancers, you know, talk about a tiny industry, yeah, <laughs> a tiny impoverished industry, but like gung ho. Yes, we need more of that. We need more of their representation. Right. And um, you know what? On the, every stage. And the Asian community also then has to stand behind them and support them. Right. And show up. Uh, I remember Absolutely. talking to George Takei uh, about two years ago, and he was saying, you know, when I go to an August Wilson play, the audience is almost all African-American because they're going to support mm-hmm. an African-American writer. But when no. I go to a David Henry Huang play, sprinkle of Asians in the audience, mm-hmm. and mostly it's white people. And so he said, you know, we also, you know, we need to walk the walk also to support those creative types who are trying to break it into the industry, into the industry and not just like let them flail around by themselves. So I think that's crucial absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. I think the new generation for sure is absolutely doing that. Yes. You know, yes. my generation not no. doing as well no. or didn't do as well until crazy rich Asians. Like I was frankly, you know, I was so unbelievably grateful and pleasantly surprised yeah. That, you know, the Asian community came out in a way that they never have before. And I kept on hearing this over and over again, you know, like, oh, my God, my parents haven't been to the movies in 20 years. Oh, wow. But they came to see yours, you know, and I was like, well, that's so true. My mom doesn't go to movies. Yeah, m- you know, mine neither. She yeah. saw was Titanic. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it was Titanic. And then she saw Crazy Rich Asians. Right. Um, 
you know, right. and she hasn't been to a movie since. Yeah. And I've heard that story over and over again. So it's like, yeah, like if we want the power, we have to prove that we have the consumer wallets exactly. to make it worth That's while. Right. That's right. Because and Hollywood ultimately is all about money, you know. That's the bottom line. So we always. need to show them the money. <laughs> and we are, Quite and frank. we are. And yeah. so and I'm so so I'm glad to hear that the other two movies are on track and you I know you have uh, some TV developments uh, projects going on as well. So Very exciting. Yeah. You're on a roll, man. I'm just, you know, I'm trying to do what I can in the limited time and window that I have open for me. Because I, you know, once again, I also come from this place of scarcity. It's like, how long will this last? Yeah. Right. Um, so that's why it's like, my mom is like, she's like, why are you working so much? Why, why don't I see you more? You know, like she wants me to travel with her half the year. And I'm like, you don't get it, mom. Yeah. Like this is, this opportunity might never come along again. Wow. You know, when people are still returning my calls, <laughs> when I can try to, seriously, when I can try to get a TV show made. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, you're viable. Right. That's going to be an all Asian cast of a drama series shown around the world. Like I'm going to go for it. And yeah, I'm going to work my ass off to make this happen if I can. Yeah. Because it might never come around again. You know, like right. I can, I can retire when I'm dead. But I'm, really. s but I am so glad <laughs> to see yeah. that there is that hunger and that, um, desire for Asian stories and Asian led, you know, TV shows and dramas mm -hmm. and what, and movies and whatnot. So I, I mean, there's definitely been a sea change. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Just if you look at, you know, post Crazy Rich Asians. Yes. Um, not to take any credit for that whatsoever, but just you just see like the farewell, Aquafina winning the Golden Globe. Oh, yeah. You see on streamers, you know, like all this amazing stuff happening. Yep. Yep. Um, I don't know if you saw Never Have I Ever. Oh, you know, it's great. I loved it. Mindy, I love loved it. I it. love it. Yeah. Love yeah. the mom. Love the mom. The, oh, my gosh. I mean, that whole amazing. series. And talk you know, about like, diversity in that show. Yeah. Amazing yeah, diversity, exactly. right? Um, There's another series I just discovered, um, Made in Heaven. Have you seen that? No, what's that? On Amazon? No. It is basically crazy rich Indians. No. In India. It's about these two wedding planners that plan the poshest weddings in Delhi. And it's so rich, so multi-layered. It's oh, so wow. groundbreaking in terms of the cultural, social issues it confronts head on like the value of women in India, oh. like being gay in India, like all these issues, but told in such a beautiful setting. It's beautiful and amazing. And like, it sort of inspires me to want to do that all the more, you know, yeah. with my characters. Oh, yeah. So oh, look for wow. it. You'll I will. It. No, no, no. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah. No, there's so much content that's so, half, the half of it. Have you seen that movie? Mm -hmm. On I've Netflix? wanted to, it's like great. it's totally on my list. Yeah, I've heard so many great things about it. Must watch that for sure. And then of course we saw um, 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 Always Be My Maybe that came yeah. out last year. So yeah, you're right. The content is definitely coming out. I hope that momentum doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. Kevin, I certainly hope you don't stop doing what you're doing. Um, all right, final- Gonna try, look, final just trying not to get sick. <laughs> final question for you with Crazy Rich Asians because I lived in Singapore for as long as yeah. I did. You had to have based some of those characters on real people. Oh, every single character is based on a real person. Oh, okay, because good. Cause, every I, that's public knowledge, dude. Because yeah. when I was I'm not reading, tell it, you who oh, it's no, no, going to no. be, but of course, Kevin. Every I, single person, I can't I, make this stuff no, up. No, 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 I can guess who they are because I think I know them. <laughs> because when you when you describe, yeah. I was just like, I know exactly who he's talking about, and so yeah, okay, just just wanted to double check yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No. Totally. No. I I always say I have no imagination. I just observe. <laughs> And I report. Well, you you definitely <laughs> you, know? uh, you definitely write it in a way that is so entertaining and so it it tra it's it transports the reader um, to you. that place and um, and that's that's kind of how I feel whenever I read your book. So, Kevin, it was such a delight talking to you. And again, same here. I hope such an honor, such a privilege. Thank honestly, you. I hope we do get to meet each other in person at some point. Let's yeah. do that. Okay. That'd be great. All right. Good luck with the book, but okay. I don't think you're going to need much luck. But, uh, and let's see, maybe it's no, going to be no, made into I, a movie. I think, you know, luck and support is, you know, it's really a horrible time for booksellers. Oh, it really is because is people can't go to bookstores like they used to. But they can order. So they can. Amazon. But I'm really trying to send out the message please, please, please support your independent bookstores. Oh, please support yeah. your, your local bookstores. Like, totally get it. You know, yes. like really because yes. they've had to close doors or be half open, you know, right. 
um, you That's know, book sales are down point. and no, we no, need no. to, we need to support, you know, our local bookseller as much as possible. I think that's a very strong message. So thank you for saying that. Um, yeah. very important. Okay. Kevin, listen, I know you're very busy and you've got so many events, but thank you so much for spending uh, the time with me. I really it's appreciate it. been so much it. fun. Okay. All right. I'll thank see you. you later. Take care. Okay. I told you that it, it was an amazing interview. Uh, it was such, it was such a great, just genuine, authentic, um, very real conversation that the two of us had. And, and honestly, we could have gone on and on. I, I knew he was on a tight schedule and actually, um, the person who set up this interview for me, uh, at the publishing company, I had asked, you know, I would love to interview Kevin for an hour if that's possible. And this guy said, sorry, half an hour. And so I thought, okay, I'll stick with the half an hour. But as we kind of were talking, it seemed like Kevin just, you know, wanted to continue talking. So I was just like, I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's why it ended up being about an hour. So again, yeah, Kevin, thank you so much for the time. I, I loved it. And you're just, I mean, geez, you are on a tear. He is on a tear. Speaking of which, I should tell you guys. So just, you know, at the end of that interview, I was saying, you know, maybe Sex and Vanity is going to be turned into a film. Well, lo and behold, there is now a film deal for Sex and Vanity. Uh, Sony Pictures and SK, SK Global just announced that they have won the rights of to acquire the film, um, acquire the rights to make the movie, Sex and Vanity. So man, I mean, more. There's just going to be more content coming out from Kevin. And then in terms of uh, television, those television projects that we briefly mentioned at the end. So through his production company, he's doing one drama, and he describes it as Downton Abbey meets David Lynch set in Asia. That sounds amazing. <laughs> And then the other is a documentary series about the family dynasties behind luxury businesses. Again, fascinating. Uh, so, uh, you know, just expect more and more stuff coming from Kevin. Uh, clearly, he's a workaholic, but clearly he loves what he does. And that's what matters most. Now, one last thing. Uh, he mentioned some of the reviews that he got from people who just didn't get it, get, didn't get the book Sex and the Vanity, Sex and Vanity and what the deeper meaning was behind the characters and the struggles that we were talking about in the interview. So I went back and, of course, I looked for some of these uh, reviews and the one that struck, struck me the most is one that he mentioned, but so this one comes from the Washington post. The reviewer is Angela hopped and I'm going to read you a bigger chunk, uh, because when I read this, I, my mouth kind of dropped. So she says though, Quan hints at the complexities of being mixed race. There's no deep, meaningful takeaway buried in the story. Few of the characters are particularly likable and they're certainly not relatable. The relationship between Cecil and Lucy never makes sense. Cecil is the waspy fiance. And Lucy's aversion to admitting her feelings for George isn't convincing. George Zhao is the Chinese guy that she meets that she falls in love with. While the luxurious scenery helps overshadow some of these shortcomings, the novel lacks the pizzazz that made Crazy Rich Asians so successful. Still, come for vacuous entertainment and sex and vanity delivers. It's all style and little substance. What in the hell? Like, completely missed the mark. Totally clueless. Like, this is what, this is why what, when Kevin and I were saying, it's hard because when people don't have the understanding and they don't, don't have the experience, but what makes it worse is that she dismisses it. She doesn't even try to understand it. She doesn't even try to grasp like, why was this character Hoppe? And what, what were, maybe were the underlying themes? She just dismisses it. And you know, that's, that's what's, um, that's what's a little bit of upsetting because these, some of these book reviewers for these very big publications, obviously, are very powerful. And so they can really influence a potential reader because not only will this review be in this paper, you know, the Washington Post and then other papers like the New York Times, they have their own reviewers, but those columns are syndicated to smaller papers across the country. And so those reviews will just be cut and pasted into those smaller newspapers. So they really are very powerful and, and influential. Uh, so, but 
Having said that, his book is still on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> so <laughs> eat that. Yeah. Anyway, I only wish Kevin well, and uh, I might be a little bit biased even more so now that I've met him and had a great conversation with him, but he's the real deal. And um, I am so proud that he is bringing Asian stories to the general public. And, you know, maybe some people don't get it, but maybe some will who maybe never understood it before. And so if he can enlighten and inform and educate in the way he does through his books, even one person, you know, then that's a difference that he's made. So um, congratulations, Kevin, again, loved having you on the show. Definitely going to have you back. Um, and we will have coffee or a cocktail in Newport at some point. Let's hope. Uh, okay. Uh, that is it for the show. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, and so take care, of course, as always stay safe and, um, you know, tell me what you thought about this show or other shows and keep on supporting, keep on subscribing, give us a review on some of the podcasts, go to Apple, uh, and just give us a nice review. And, and th cause that really does help. It really, really does help us. Okay. All right. I'll see you next time.